right, here we go. Hello and welcome everyone who are just joining us. We're just going to give it a, a few seconds here to let a few more people in. Um, then we'll get started. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone who are joining us today for this final presentation in our Votes for Women, Richfield Celebrates the 19th Amendment series. Um, the series it has been running throughout 2020. We are kind of planning a, a ratification party on August of 2021. Hopefully we'll all be good by then and we can gather then at Keeler Tavern to, to celebrate. Um, but more on that later. But before I begin, I'd really like to um, give special thanks to all of the community partners who have made this series possible. Uh, Hilde Grob and Hilary McAleese from Keeler Tavern Museum and History Centre, uh, Sharon Dunphy, Catherine Tufano and Sarah Champion from the Richfield Historical Society. And Sarah's also from the Drumhill chapter of the DAR, which have helped with this series. And also our wonderful library staff, uh, Laurie McGavin Backman and Andy Forsyth, who is here with us today, and uh, Brenda McKinley. We've all worked very hard on this series over the last couple of years, and I, I think it's been a great success. If you've missed any of the programs, we did record some of them on our library YouTube channel, so be sure to check that out as well. Um, today's program is made possible thanks to Connecticut Humanities, so we'd like to thank them. And now I'd like to welcome Andy Forsyth, our Assistant Director at the Library. She is going to introduce Elaine today and she's also going to help with moderating the Q&A. If you do have any questions as we go, just put them in the Q&A function and we'll get to them later in the program. So thank you everyone for coming again. Thanks, Andy. And thank you, Leslie. Um, we are so thrilled and grateful to welcome Elaine Weiss back to Ridgefield. She was able to join us in May for uh, one of the discussions of her book, The Woman's Hour. Um, Elaine Weiss is an award-winning journalist and writer. Her previous book is called Fruits of Victory, The Woman's Land Army in the Great War. She's also written for The Atlantic, Harper's, The Christian Science Monitor, uh, been featured in NPR and Voice of America coverage, and for the New York Times. And some of those New York Times articles, we'll be sharing some links later in the chat, uh, so you can take a look at that. And thank you so much, Elaine. I'm going to turn it over to you, and it's uh, a very timely topic, and we're thrilled to have you. Well, thank you so much, Andy. And I'm delighted to be with you, at least virtually, uh, at the Ridgefield Library. And it's a special uh, place for me to be talking today um, because it's a special place for um, a woman on my publishing team, uh, Carolyn Colburn, uh, who directed all the, uh, the great uh, publicity and my tours. And her parents were very involved uh, in the library at Ridgefield. And so um, I sort of dedicate this talk to them, uh, uh, Caroline and Ken Colburn. So uh, it is a, a personal pleasure for me to be with you here today. And of course, um, I'm honored to be part of your Votes uh, for Women program. Libraries are vitally important uh, to every community, especially uh, in the times we're in right now. Um, and every reader is, uh, very grateful to the libraries and certainly every author. I depend upon libraries for my research, um, spend many hours in the stacks and in uh, microfilm booths and in manuscript uh, offices. And um, I also then depend upon libraries to bring my book to my readers. So uh, libraries are important to me and it's very satisfying for me to be with you uh, and talk about books. So today I want to tell you a story about democracy and about social justice and about the power of citizen activists. 
And those are very timely topics right now, as you can imagine. I want to talk about American women's fight for the right to vote, as we have just gone through not only the centennial of women's right to vote in America, but also um, a time of a very uh, contentious election and a time when our democracy democracy is being tested in ways it has not been before. So it's, a, uh, I don't think I expected this book to be as very timely <laughs> as it is right now, but um, I think we'll find some fascinating reverberations from the story I'm about to tell you. And Connecticut plays a fascinating, but also very frustrating role in the long campaign for women's suffrage. And here's a photo uh, of the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association members during one of their many attempts to convince the state legislature to give women a voice in their government. And I hate to tell you, but uh, over and over, the answer from Hartford was no. Uh, but the women of Connecticut eventually did get the vote through the 19th Amendment, whose centennial we're celebrating. Um, and this is the story I tell how that change happened. It's a story of a women of uh, American women's demand for the vote, which was once considered radical, crazy, subversive, impossible. But it was slowly and methodically and through enormous toil transformed into constitutional law. It's a story of the 19th Amendment, the largest extension of the franchise in our nation's history, giving the vote to half of the citizens of the nation who were not included when the founding fathers constructed their government supposedly by and for the people. So it's really a story about how change is made in a democracy and in society. And at a moment when we are um, experiencing and witnessing calls for change, it makes it all the more important to understand this story. The 19th Amendment was not just a legal change. It was not just a constitutional change. It wasn't just an election law change. It didn't just double the national electorate. It didn't, pardon me, it didn't just um, make women full citizens for the very first time. It really marked a societal change, a cultural shift about the role and the rights of women in society. And as we know that shift is still ongoing. The fight for women's suffrage is one of the defining civil rights struggles in our nation's history. And it's one that cuts to the heart of what democracy means. Who gets to participate? Who has a voice in our government? And when we say we the people, do we really mean everyone? And of course, we are asking those same questions today. Now, if you read our standard history textbooks, uh, you'll only get a brief fuzzy idea of how American women won, and that active verb won is very important. We were not given the vote. We were not granted the vote. It had to be fought for, uh, bitterly fought for. Um, but the way it's usually described is women, American women, asked for the vote at the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in 1848. And then in 1920, men gave them the vote. That is not accurate. <laughs> um, again, it's looked at as the March of Progress. It just happened naturally. It was evolution of an idea whose time had come. No, that's not how it happened. It required three generations of fearless activists working over seven decades to finally secure the vote for American women. And the culmination of that crusade, what we call the women's suffrage movement, came down to a fierce six week battle staged in Nashville, Tennessee. And that's what my book tells the story of. Now, in the summer of 1920, only one last state was needed to ratify the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, which would give the right to vote to every woman, woman of, of uh, age uh, and eligibility in every state 
uh, in every election. And this would be the first time that was allowed. 35 states had ratified and 36 or three quarters of the states of the union were needed to ratify for the amendment to become law. If the amendment failed in Tennessee, it could be delayed indefinitely and perhaps not enacted anytime in the foreseeable future. And the suffragists feared this and there was reason for them to fear this. If we think about the Equal Rights Amendment, which was the next amendment, um, that was introduced and it was introduced in 1923 and it is still not ratified. So the suffragists were worried uh, that if Tennessee failed, the amendment would fail and the enfranchisement of half of the citizens of the nation were at stake and it all came down to Tennessee. Now it could have come down to Connecticut and we'll talk about that later. Now by 1920, the suffragists have been fighting for the vote for 72 years. Since that first outrageous demand for the vote was made by Elizabeth Cady Stanton at the Seneca Falls rights meeting in 1848. Now it's useful to recall in mid 19th century America, what a woman, especially a married woman, had very few legal rights. The idea of uh, a women's rights convention was almost an oxymoron. The laws of coverture ruled her. She could not own property or control her own money or her inheritance. Everything she had belonged to her husband. Her children also belonged to their father. A mother had no custodial rights. If she left the marriage, she left her children. A woman was not supposed to speak in public as I am to you right now. Doing what I'm doing in fact was considered um, promiscuous. Um, a woman could not attend most colleges or universities or professional schools. Most occupations were closed to her. A woman could not bring civil suit in a court of law or testify nor serve on, the, on a jury. She could not be judged by a jury of her peers because no women could serve. Um, and of course, she could not vote. Nevertheless, Many of those attending the Seneca Falls meeting in that July of 1848 thought that Stanton's call for the vote was a terrible idea. It was too radical. It was ridiculous, they thought. But there was a young man in the audience. They, he had ridden his buggy 50 miles from his home in Rochester, to New York to attend the meeting. And he stood up. And he said, no, you must demand the right to vote. It will never be given to you and it will never be given to me. And he supported Elizabeth Stanton's call for enfranchisement of women. And it was Frederick Douglass, just 30 years old, just 10 years out of slavery. And he persuaded the other very reluctant uh, participants at the Seneca Falls Conference to support Elizabeth Stanton's call for the vote. And he called himself a woman's rights man for the rest of his life. And he truly, truly was. He's one of the heroes of the book um, and one of the heroes of women's suffrage. And he, you know, it's no coincidence that he was there. He didn't happen to just show up. He was invited because Elizabeth Stanton and Lucretia Mott and uh, uh, the other organizers of the Seneca Falls Conference had worked with Douglas for years now because these women, these four mothers, as we think of them, uh, Stanton and Susan Anthony and Mott and Lucy Stone were actually abolition organizers before they were even suffrage workers. And um, the two um, uh, causes of abolition and women's suffrage were actually entwined and there was an overlapping group of activists uh, for both those causes through the Civil War. They're really sibling movements through the Civil War. And um, the women of the abolition movement and slash suffrage movement fully expect that after the war, universal suffrage will be enacted. Black men and white and black women will all get the right to vote, all the disenfranchised uh, classes, but they were 
sorely disappointed and when they were told that the nation could not handle two large reforms at once. And as we see so often, powers that be pit, pitted two disenfranchised groups against one another, saying only one of you can be rewarded. And that caused a heartbreaking split. Stanton and Anthony refused to support the 15th Amendment, which gave the right to vote only to Black men, not Black women, not white women. And since women were excluded, Stanton and Anthony expressed vile racist sentiments against black and immigrant men, all men who were just not as well educated as they were, but were able to vote. And race would continue to vex this movement um, employed by the suffragists when politically expedient, and e but even more so by the anti-suffragists who would use race as a weapon against women's enfranchisement. Now, in the years following Seneca Falls, tens of thousands of dedicated suffragists waged over 900 local, state, and national campaigns to win the vote. They traveled hundreds of thousands of miles to do as Susan Anthony described it, organize, educate, and agitate in tiny towns and big cities across the nation. And here we see they begin their um, travels in horse and buggy in the early uh, days of the movement. Here they are in another horse and buggy. By the end of the campaign in 1920, they're campaigning from cars. Now, the reason they had to travel so much is they had to change hearts and minds about women's role in society before they could change the law. And this is really important for us to understand that educational process that has to go on. And when you think of it, it was a stupendous feat of organization without any of the travel or communication tools we take for granted today. When the movement started, passenger train travel was in its infancy. The telegraph had just been invented. There was no typewriter. There was no telephone. Everything was done by hand by foot, on, on foot, I should say, um, in person. And they held meetings and they held rallies and they marched, which was not considered proper for women to do. They didn't wear pink, <clears throat> pink pussy hats, but they did wear their marching uniforms, white dresses, with yellow sashes. And here we see some wonderful um, photos of women wearing those white uniforms, their marching uniforms. When we see um, women in Congress, uh, when we see um, uh, Geraldine Ferraro ex accept the vice presidential nomination, when we see Hillary Clinton uh, in, in, in wearing white, when we see Hillary Clinton accepting the presidential nomination in white, and just this summer when we saw K Kamala Harris accept her nomination wearing white, and then when she, when um, named a vice president elect, again she's wearing white. This is in honor of the suffragists. Um, so wearing the white yellow sashes, but it's really hard um, to imagine how brave a woman had to be to march like this, to stand up publicly for political equality. They, in, they had to endure, here's again, some wonderful photos of, of women wearing and marching, had to endure contempt and ridicule in their communities, in their churches, and in the press. We're gonna see some rather strong images of what the anti-suffragists threw up against suffrage advocates. Uh, again, what would I do with the suffragists? It's all about keeping women silent. They, having political views was not considered appropriate. Um, women suffragists were um, pelted with rotten eggs and spoiled vegetables. They were attacked by mobs of angry men. They were denounced as radicals, perverts, traitors, anarchists, bad wives and mothers, even Bolsheviks. 
Sound familiar? Here's a question, uh, a, a, um, a poster that was aimed at men who would be uh, voting in state referenda to decide whether women should vote because states then and now are in control of uh, electoral eligibility and um, also operating elections. We've gotten a good um, education in that in the last few months. Uh, but here the, again, which do you prefer, your wife to be home as a loving mother or a crazed zealot on the street advocating for women's rights? They were derided as unattractive, unsexed she-men. Here's one of those kind of cartoons. Um, and the men who supported them were belittled as Mabels and Nancys. Here they are, you can kind of guess which of these women was supposedly the suffragist. And again, they were going to um, upset the natural order of the American home. Here is a, an anti-suffrage uh, illustration, when women vote, mom is smoking a cigar and reading the sporting life news while dad is holding the screaming babies and um, marriage rules have been revised, not in his favor. Here's another one, when women vote, here's election day, uh, mom's gonna sail out um, to vote, leaving dad again with the screaming babies. It becomes quite the motif. Um, the anti-suffragists and the men who's, who were against it um, were not subtle about what they feared. This idea of women having equal rights would emasculate American men. And here's one of my favorite <laughs> illustrations, bed of trouble, and I think it's self-explanatory. Clearly suffragists were frightening to a large segment of the population. Now, in their quest for equal suffrage, the women uh, of the movement employed a wide variety of stratagems and methods. And many of these marches, as we've seen, demonstrations, picketing, which we're about to see, acts of civil disobedience, legal test cases to the Supreme Court would all be adopted by the civil rights campaigns of later in the 20th and even in the 21st centuries. The suffragists were ingenious and fearless. They had to be. To test the prohibitions against women voting, Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, and about 150 other women actually voted in the 1872 presidential election. And here's a uh, contemporary magazine with Susan Anthony on the cover. It's entitled The Woman Who Dared. She's usurping Uncle Sam's cap, and she has her always threatening umbrella with her. Um, Susan Anthony, as the face of the movement, was soon arrested, put on trial, and convicted of illegal voting in a federal election. She brought her case to the public in a series of uh, lectures. She gave about 75 of these under the title, Is it a crime for a US citizen to vote? And of course, we are still asking that question again today. Failure of this voting experiment led Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton to draft a constitutional amendment, one that would supersede all the state laws that prohibited women from voting. This amendment was introduced into Congress in 1878 and it was stalled there for 40 years. The amendment was voted down in committee or on the floor of the House and Senate 28 times. Meanwhile, the suffragists had to work to change voting laws in the states, which again, controlled the voting rights of its residents. And Connecticut women began agitating for the vote soon after the close of the Civil War. The, um, and here we see one of the early banners of the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association. In 1867, Frances Ellen Burr of Hartford collected signatures on a petition in support of women's suffrage. And a bill was introduced into the Connecticut legislature to allow women to vote. This is very, very early. It was voted down, but it spurred interest 
And in 1869, Burr, together with Isabella Beecher Hooker, daughter of the minister Lyman Beecher and sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, organized a small band of women into the Connecticut Women's Suffrage Association. Hooker and Burr would continue to lead the Connecticut suffragists for almost four decades, but it was lonely work. Burr called, recalled that she and Hooker were, quote, pretty much alone in the early years in their efforts. Connecticut was a very conservative state, both culturally and politically, but slowly interest in women's rights and political rights began to grow. There were a few small victories in 1877, married women gained the right to control their own property in Connecticut. And in 1882, women lawyers were admitted to the Connecticut bar. But opposition to suffrage um, held firm and discouragement set in. By 1900, membership in the Connecticut Suffrage Association had dwindled to only about 50 members and only $21.75 was spent on suffrage activities all through the year. After a decade of doldrums, the Connecticut Association sprung to life again in 1909 with a new cadre of young activists taking on leadership positions and bringing new ideas and new strategies. Catherine Houghton Hepper, mother of six in West Hartford, took over the reins of the association. Whoops, here we go, I have a picture of her. Um, she looks very much like her daughter. Um, and uh, Carolyn Rutz reese the headmistress of Rosemary Hall Academy, brought her talents to the cause. And so did Carolyn Luddington, a portrait painter in Old Lyme. And they re-energized the group, launching rallies and leafleting drives and petition campaigns. You're gonna see some of these. Um, and they expanded interest in the suffrage cause to working women in Connecticut's factories and immigrant women in the state. In 1911, they embarked upon a, a month long automobile tour through hostile territory, Litchfield County the seat of strong anti-suffrage sentiment. Riding in flag deck cars with votes for women banners and streamers, they held rallies in 32 communities around the county, attended by more than 5,000 people, and almost 1,000 of them signed petitions supporting votes for women. By May of 1914, the Connecticut Association was feeling confident enough to stage a suffrage parade in Hartford. And here's some pictures of the parade. Um, 2,000 participants marching, riding on floats, waving from decorated automobiles, carrying banners, and cameramen recorded the march. And the moving picture was shown in theaters across Connecticut, boosting interest in the suffrage cause. And here, again, some great pictures. Um, but all this public display also stimulated pushback from those opposed to women gaining equal political rights. The Connecticut Association opposed to women's suffrage, part of a national anti-suffrage movement based in Boston and in New York, made their presence known, writing letters to the editors of newspapers, lobbying legislators, testifying before committees. The group declared its intention to leave nothing undone that might help the downfall of the suffragists. Its old Lyme branch counted 125 members by 1915. And they certainly had the ear of the Republican party in Connecticut, which was the dominant party. The legislature rejected suffrage bills in every single session. Both of Connecticut's US senators, Frank Branagie and George McLean, voted against the federal amendment in Congress whenever it came up, helping to keep it stalled there for 40 years. And still by 1917, the Connecticut Association of Suffragists could boast a membership of over 32,000 people, both men and women. And it had a robust legislative agenda, but the legislature continued to derail three separate suffrage bills introduced in Congress and uh, pardon me, in Hartford in 1917 while the federal amendment still languished in Congress as 
the US entered World, <clears throat> World War I. And here's a picture of the uh, suffrage office in Hartford. I love this picture. The slow pace of progress in the states, in Congress, stirred frustration and anger among suffragists. And a new generation, the third generation of suffragists grew impatient. They were no longer willing to wait, no longer um, wanting to plead politely. They were willing to be aggressive, rude if necessary, disruptive, willing to even break the law. The movement split as reform movements often do over strategy and tactics. A young Quaker woman named Alice Paul, who had trained with the more radical Pankhurst uh, group in uh, Great Britain when she was a graduate student, left the mainstream American suffrage organization to practice direct action techniques. Her National Women's Party would begin to picket the White House, protest on the steps of the Capitol, and even burn President Woodrow Wilson in effigy. Connecticut suffrage president, Catherine Houghton Hepburn quit the National American Suffrage Association, the mainstream historical um, uh, organization of Stanton and Anthony and denounced it as old fashioned and supine. And she joined Alice Paul's Women's Party taking several other Connecticut Association board members with her. Between 1917 and 1919, 14 Connecticut Women's Party suffragists were arrested and imprisoned for picketing in DC, including Catherine Flanagan of Hartford, who we see here, a national organizer for the Women's Party, who will, we meet again in Nashville. They also arrested at this time, Helena Hill Weed of Norfolk, uh, Norwalk, pardon me, Norwalk, uh, one of the first female geologists in the US and daughter of Connecticut Congressman Ebenezer Hill. And she was imprisoned for carrying a banner. And here we see her in prison. In 1918, she would be imprisoned twice more. The Connecticut women were among the hundreds of women's party suffragists arrested and serving time in prison for their civil disobedience. They were tortured and force fed. Tubes rammed down their noses. They were manacled to their cells. They were not allowed to even speak to one another. <clears throat> they communicated by singing. They were held in decrepit vermin infested cells. Um, and when they were finally released, they toured the country in copies of their prison uniforms. It was called the Prison Special. It was a Pullman uh, railroad car that went across the nation on a Northern route and then back on a Southern route. They stopped in many, many towns and they would give lectures and, and hold rallies and parades. The prison special arrived in Hartford in February of 1919, where 250 suffrage supporters greeted the, the uh, train and raised $500 at a fundraising breakfast. The president of the Connecticut um, Association of Women opposed to suffrage warned the suffragists were allied with the Reds and were trying to incite class and race hatred. Seems like it's ripped from today's headlines, doesn't it? Finally, in June of 1919, after World War I was over and American women had participated in the war in, in ways they'd never uh, done before, the federal amendment was passed by both houses of Congress and went to the states for ratification. But the Connecticut legislature had already adjourned and would not convene again until 1921. Connecticut suffragists immediately began pushing Governor Marcus Holcomb to hold a special ses session, but he refused. He used the excuse. He could only call a special session in a case of special emergency and women's suffrage was not an emergency to his lights. So by the spring of 1920, with 35 states having ratified and only one more needed, Connecticut held the power to give the vote to all American women, but the governor refused. 
the, gov the Connecticut suffragists tried to impress upon the governor, this really was an emergency and a flying emergency corps was mustered. 48 women, one from each state, doctors, lawyers, scientists, businesses, business women, professional women, professors, public officials, they all threw, uh, flew to New York City, received a pep talk and instructions, and then took the train to Hartford. And they spread out over the state in squadrons. They visited 36 towns and cities. They held 41 meetings in four days. They gave speeches. They met with local officials. They interviewed all the members of the legislature. And then they confronted Governor Holcomb in his chambers in the Capitol. And they each made short, impassioned statements. The governor just shrugged, said he'd have to think about it. A few days later, he said, nope, no emergency. I'm not calling the legislature. So he refused to call the legislature back to consider the 19th Amendment and Connecticut failed to become the 36th state. And it came down to Tennessee. Now, Tennessee was a dangerous place to stage this definitive battle for women's suffrage. Nearly all the other Southern states had already rejected the amendment and all of them using similar racist rationale. They did not want black women to be able to vote. So the suffragists knew that they faced an uphill battle in Tennessee, but they had no choice. Tennessee was their last best chance. So all the forces for and against women's suffrage gathered in Nashville uh, and they were joined by more than a thousand men and women from across the state and around the nation. There were powerful forces working against ratification in Tennessee, political, corporate and ideological foes, each with their own reasons for opposing the amendment, politicians, who feared an unpredictable new voting bloc. 27 million women would be eligible to vote if the amendment was ratified and no one knew how they were going to vote. Clergymen who believed that women voting went against the will of God, who purposefully made Eve to be subservient to Adam and to question this went against God's plan. Um, and they used biblical uh, language to rail against women's suffrage from the pulpit. Corporations, why do corporations have to do with women's suffrage? Well, a lot. Um, several of them believed that women would be bad for business, bad for their bottom line if they could vote. The textile manufacturers, for instance, were afraid that women voters might want to abolish child labor. And those industries and those mills relied on the cheap labor of not only children, but of women. The liquor industry feared that if women voters um, were allowed to vote 1920, even though prohibition, the 18th amendment was already law, that they would insist on strict enforcement of the prohibition laws. And they were trying to keep women away from the ballot box for as long as possible. Uh, it came down to a rather comical set of uh, scenes in my book where the liquor lobby sponsors a speakeasy on the eighth floor of the Hermitage Hotel where everyone is staying during the, the Nashville ratification battle. It came to be known as the Jack Daniels Suite, uh, named after Tennessee's favorite liquor, where legislators were plied with free liquor day and night and encouraged to vote against ratification. But it turned out that the most passionate foes of the 19th Amendment's ratification were women. That women might oppose their own enfranchisement was really shocking to me when I came upon it in my research. But we have to understand that many of these antis, as they were called, antis, were social and religious uh, conservative women who truly believed that um, suffrage would bring about a profound and unhealthy shift in gender roles. It would endanger the American home and bring about, in their words, the moral collapse of the nation. It would alter private life, not just political life. And this is an important reminder that the debate over women's suffrage was never just a political argument. It was also a social and cultural and moral debate about the role of women in society. It was a 
precursor of what we now call the culture wars. And here's one of my favorite anti-suffrage broadsides, America when feminized. And it shows a rooster and a hen and the rooster, uh, pardon me, the hen is wearing a votes for women sash. She's just walked off the nest and the uh, rooster calls after her and says, Ma, the eggs are gonna get cold. And she calls back to him, sit on them yourself, old man. My nation calls me. And one of the many um, uh, uh, taglines at the bottom says, a vote for the federal suffrage amendment is a vote for organized female nagging forever. So, <laughs> would have made a good bumper sticker, I think. All sides come to Nashville and confront one another and it gets wild. There's bribes and booze and propaganda and blackmail, conspiracies and kidnappings and fistfights. The newspapers call it suffrage Armageddon. The outcome remains in doubt until the very last moment. And I won't spoil it for you, but it does come down to a single vote of conscience from the youngest member of the legislature who receives a letter from his mother. Now, all of this took place exactly a century ago, but there are some surprising and even unnerving modern themes, even more themes than I knew when I was writing the book. This history helps explain where we've been and where we are right now. It deals with topics that dominate our headlines at this very moment, voting rights and voter suppression, women's rights, inequality, dark money in politics, the role of religion in formulating public policy, and racism. Because the history of women's suffrage in America is inevitably a story about race. In Nashville, there are cries of white supremacy and states' rights. The Ku Klux Klan is invoked as a dog whistle and the Confederate flag is flown in defiance. Here's a picture of the opening ceremonies for the um, anti-suffrage ratification headquarters in the Hermitage Hotel in August of 1920 with the stars and bars um, and uh, the anti-suffrage leaders posing with a veteran of the Civil War. Now, I think there are important lessons for us to be learned from the fight for women's suffrage. Lessons with special meanings for this moment, that social change is slow and political change is hard, but both are possible. That protest is patriotic and necessary, but it must be followed up by well-designed and sustained political strategies. The suffragists did not just march and picket, they debated and lobbied and drafted legislation and campaigned. And they did not rest after the 19th Amendment entered the Constitution. Carrie Catt founded the League of Women Voters, which is also celebrating its centennial anniversary this year. And Alice Paul drafted the Equal Rights Amendment, which, as I mentioned before, was introduced into Congress in 1923 and is still not ratified. Another lesson or fully ratified, I should say. Another lesson we learned is that the struggle to expand our democracy is ongoing. It was not accomplished in 1920. It is not complete today. While the 19th Amendment gave the vote to all women, Black women and men in the Southern states would not be able to enjoy their right to vote for another four decades. Jim Crow laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, intimidation and violence kept them from the polls until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 provided a legal rem <clears throat> remedy. Native American women and Asian American women were not considered citizens in 1920, and so they were not covered by the 19th Amendment, and they also would have to wait decades longer to vote. And in recent years, essential enforcement provisions of the Voting Rights Act have been gutted and we see an alarming number of states enact laws restricting access to the polls for targeted voters. And we know we, have, we saw a great deal of that in this election cycle. 
I want to close with some words from Carrie Chapman Catt, who um, is very much a central character in my book. She's the leader of the um, mainstream suffrage organization and the international suffrage organizations. And just days after the 19th Amendment finally entered the Constitution, uh, she returned home, she lived in Westchester, and wrote a message to the women of America. It was a benediction and a charge. And I find it as powerful and meaningful now as it was then. And I'd like to close with her words. The vote is the emblem of your equality, women of America, and I might add, men of America too. The guarantee of your liberty. That vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and the lives of thousands of women. Women have suffered agony of soul, which you can never comprehend that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly, prize it. The vote is a power, a weapon of offense and defense, a prayer. Understand what it means and what it can do for your country. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. The vote is won. 72 years the battle for this privilege has been waged, but human affairs with their eternal change move on without pause. Progress is calling to you to make no pause. Act. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Elaine. Um, uh, I was just looking at the final slide that you showed and uh, in celebrating 100 years of the League of Women Voters, we want to also recognize um, how important our local League of Women Voters of Ridgefield and its president, Marilyn Carroll, have been in, in all of the work we've done this year in celebrating the 100 years of um, one step in the journey toward, toward suffrage uh, equality. Um, I would encourage anyone with a question to put your question in the Q&A function of the, um, the Zoom uh, interface here. If you're, if you're not familiar, Q&A is down at the bottom, along the bottom row there in front of you. Um, I had a question that came up from um, a, an opinion piece that you wrote for the New York Times in August, looking at that wild and woolly week between ratification in Tennessee and getting the actual text of the amendment to um, Mr. Colby and, and the folks, the powers that be in Washington, DC, and the efforts to drum up, um, rescind the vote and you know, go back to the people. And if you could comment a little bit on the resonance that you see maybe um, happening right now with efforts to deny the reality of action. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a little disturbing to see <laughs> how prescient that was. Um, uh, after the ratification battle that I describe in detail in, in the Women's Hour, um, it, it's not really the very end of the story. And I, and I um, describe that in the book and then I describe it in that um, op-ed for the New York Times because what I realized was um, even at that point in the late summer that there were, um, um, comments being made um, both by the president and, and by um, other, um, other, other members of the government and supporters um, that um, for the first time, we might witness a uh, deliberate um, uh, denial or, or refusal to accept a, uh, the results of a democratic vote. Um, and uh, this, this, again, is not something that, that we had ever experienced on a national level in modern times, but I realized that it, it really was what happened at the 19th, with the 19th Amendment. There were uh, those who opposed it were just uh, refused to accept it. And they went to, to great lengths. Um, I described some of the rallies that they held. They called them indignation rallies. They'd have great bonfires. Uh, they became very um, heated, uh, a lot of racist language used. They threatened the legislators who voted for to, to ratify the amendment. They um, 
uh, you know, vowed not to accept it, not to uh, abide by it. Uh, they, they sent representatives to Washington to uh, try to get the uh, Secretary of State, who is the kind of final person to sign off on it before it enters the Constitution to, to get him to rescind it. They actually, um, uh, the, the state, the Tennessee legislature in this kind of bizarre move actually rescinds its own ratification um, of the 19th Amendment. Now, it's moot legally. There's no do-overs in, in ratification, but um, you get the sense of this, this uh, turmoil um, and this um, real uh, backlash against progress. And of course, we are witnessing uh, an extraordinary and a disturbing um, example of how this can be done, not just uh, by some um, state representatives in Tennessee now, but we're seeing it at the highest levels. So uh, I'm afraid I did describe something that has come to pass. And uh, I hope, I, I can only hope that there is um, uh, some, some um, sanity returns quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and please, anyone uh, add your questions for Elaine in the Q&A. Um, and taking a look, seeing what, what's coming through. We've got a question. What was the most surprising or important thing you learned when researching and writing your book and how it relates to today's issues? Yeah, well, I was surprised by many things. Um, it was, I had a lot of aha moments in the, in the research process. Um, and that's really, I thought was, was because I'm not um, a suffered scholar. I haven't spent my career studying this. I came to it with fresh eyes um, and a, a very open slate, uh, just as many of my readers do. And so I, I tried to then channel the surprise that I, I, of, of discovery. Uh, to my readers in the book. Um, I think the first one, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to answer just one. Um, one of them was um, uh, that Frederick Douglass was at Seneca Falls and the intertwining of, of race in this story, which I shouldn't have been surprised by completely because um, uh, American history is almost always about race, but um, it did surprise me how important Douglas was to the movement and um, how uh, racist arguments would be used to uh, fight the 19th Amendment. And we see that happen in Tennessee uh, in, in a very uh, virulent way. Um, so, so I think the, the idea of race um, being a subtext, a political and social subtext was, was a bit, uh, and that, going on for uh, you know, almost a hundred years was uh, of the suffrage uh, fight was, was surprising. The, the second was how long it took and realizing how long um, a process this was and that it had to be a cultural and social and um, a sort of consciousness raising uh, campaigns for, for decades before there was enough momentum for political change and legal change. And that's something that we may need to remember as we uh, press for, for institutional change today. Not that we should be patient to, to, uh, and, and say, oh, we can wait another, another century to get this straight. No, we can't. But also remember that, um, again, protest is one, one part of this, uh, one part of the, the uh, uh, mechanism for change and, and then uh, creating a, um, and uh, educating a, a, a population about what is needed to, to make that change and then uh, a political, a very sophisticated political campaign uh, to, to enact those changes is, you know, it, it's, it's not simple, but I think we can look to movements like suffrage to see some of the, the blueprints. Um, uh, I'll tell you another one that, that uh, I think is, is very relevant is um, the split um, 
in the suffrage movement and then the anti-suffragists. I didn't know that there were organized groups of women to, to fight the 19th Amendment. But then we will see them, um, we'll see that um, conservative women's political organizations become stronger throughout the 20th century. And we'll see them um, really be a force during everything from the McCarthy era to uh, Phyllis Schlafly and her Women of the Eagle Forum fighting the ERA at the very last uh, steps before that almost became law in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and we see that today. Um, we see the, the this is um, that, that there is no uh, monolithic women's vote. Why should we expect there would be? Uh, but I think that it teaches us a lot to see the kinds of arguments that were used and many of those arguments are still alive today. And we've got a couple questions that pick up on, on things you just said, Great. asking about the women's vote and if you know the percentage of women who did vote in the first national election after the amendment was ratified in 1920. And then another question that is asking the status of ERA right now. Um, I know there was some action happening at the beginning of 2020. And, and if you know where we're at right now. Okay, yep. Um, yes, In so the first vote. Uh, now remember, uh, something I don't go into uh, deeply in, in my little, my little uh, talk this afternoon was, um, there are two ways to get the vote. And one is, through state action. Again, that's why <laughs> states are in charge of elections. And that's why we've seen this uh, in a circus of the last, um, the last cycle because every state has its own requirements for identification and for voting uh, eligibility. Every state runs it differently. Every state has a recount of uh, different, different procedures. So uh, we've gotten a real <laughs> education in that. But um, states, the constitution gives states the, um, the power to decide which of their residents can vote. And um, the reason there had to be a federal amendment because it was quite clear that though some, there were probably be about, I don't know, depending how you, you uh, count it, 10 to 15 states by 1920 had given um, their women citizens the right to vote, including New York, including California, including um, many in the West, many states in the West, in Oregon, Washington, but in the Mid-Atlantic and New England, it was, and in the South, it was quite clear that women would not get the right to vote if they, um, unless there was a federal amendment, uh, the states would never give it to them. So there are women who, who have been voting for a while, but now this is in incorporating many more, uh, including black women who, who many of whom were able to vote, um, but um, it would get more difficult for them. But in 1920, just like 10 weeks after ratification, uh, only about one in three eligible women actually went to the polls. Um, you know, there's something like 27 million and about 10 million vote. And this was disappointing to the suffragists. And the press went to Carrie Chapman Catt as the leader of the, uh, of the movement and said, so what happened? You've been working for seven decades and then your women don't come out to vote. And she said, well, you know, uh, voting is a learned experience. Voting is something you you practice, you learn to do it, you learn uh, how to do it. And that's one of the reasons she established the League of Women Voters to teach women, and also it's always open to men and especially immigrant men, uh, to teach how to vote, how to, to study the issues, how to study the candidates, how to make it a habit to vote. Um, and when you realize that, although it was now legally, um, uh, acceptable for or, or possible for women to vote might not be acceptable in their towns, uh, in their neighborhoods, um, where you made a very a very public statement by standing in line to vote, and your your pastor might still be railing against it. Your 
family may not think it's a great idea. Your garden club may be still resistant. Um, you know, I'd love to know how many women in Litchfield, uh, which seem to be a hotbed of anti-suffrage activity, how many uh, women there voted. So um, you, you have a, a series of, of both political and social pressures that might be on, on women in this, this first couple of uh, election days. But what is a little more surprising and distressing is that the um, percentage of women voting um, does not equal the percentage of, Ameri of American men voting until for four more decades, until around 1960. And then it, it, it catches up. And by 1980, the percentage of women voting will surpass men. And it's, that gap has been widening ever since. So um, more women than men vote uh, in our national elections. And we, you know, I don't think we have the numbers yet for the 2020 cycle, but um, uh, it will take a long time to catch up. Oh, and the ERA, right. Um, so the Equal Rights Amendment, again, needs 38 states, because now we have 50 states. So three quarters is 38 states. Um, it, con when, when it finally passed Congress, it was, it was bottled up in Congress for 50 years, even longer than the suffrage amendment. When it finally comes out in the mid 1970s, Congress maliciously puts in a, a, a sunset, puts in a, a deadline, says it has to be ratified within, I think it's five years. And um, it, it does not meet that deadline. So there is an extension and it looks like it's gonna go through. It just needs a few more. It looks like it's sailing through when the, the anti ERA uh, organizations uh, like the Eagle Forum uh, led by Phyllis Schlafly who comes out of that same pipeline uh, of the anti suffragists uh, which I trace and actually at the end of the book, but um, they halt it. They um, go into the state legislatures that are going to be um, uh, considering this and they, they make their argument strong enough that those states refuse to ratify, the clock ticks down and the ERA is in limbo as there are many um, unratified uh, amendments for four decades. It comes back up in the, just the last few years. Um, Illinois ratified in, I think, 2018 and Virginia in 2019. So now we are at 38. But the question is, does it count because it's after that congressional deadline? So there are bills in Congress um, to uh, say that you know, that deadline wasn't really legal and, and it should be accepted and it should go through the, just, you know, be stamped as, as ratified. But um, there's enough opposition uh, to this, to the idea of, of a, a general equal rights bill for women that it will inevitably end up in the courts. It'll be very interesting in the new administration to see how it's, um, it's taken, um, how the Senate goes will, will make a difference. So um, I think we just have to wait and see, but it's, it's still in limbo. Thank you for that. And I'm encouraging anyone who has questions to uh, please go ahead, type in the Q&A function. Um, I know that Leslie will be putting together a quick poll. Um, we'd love for you to just do a, a click and submit that is helpful for us in wrapping up our grant from Connecticut Humanities. Um, she's got that up right now. Um, it's just a couple of questions. We would appreciate your participation. Um, while we're waiting, I did have a question, uh, Elaine. You had written a piece in the New York Times in the spring um, about the pandemic flu and um, you know when the influenza uh, epidemic pandemic hit in 1917, 1918, it really was a vital period for the effort for suffrage. and if you had a few comments about what kind of impact that had on the on, uh, the efforts to, for suffrage. Yeah, well, when I was writing the book, um, the 
effects of the pandemic, uh, which, which really surged, uh, had, a, had a second wave in, in fall of 1918 and went on into 1919, um, was, you know, it just seemed like an historical piece of uh, interest. I, I did not imagine we'd be living through one uh, in our own generation. So uh, I didn't make a whole lot of it. I just kind of mentioned it. And then of course, uh, when we began to have to contend with the disruptions of, of our own pandemic right now, um, I realized that uh, we were having to deal with it uh, in many ways, the same way the suffragists did. In 1918 was a big election year when um, uh, suffragists were trying to flip the Senate uh, sounds familiar. Uh, they were trying to get more um, pro-suffrage um, uh, senators elected and try to get rid of some of the ones who were, were voting it down every time it came up. And so they were vigorously campaigning in, in uh, several states to, to um, get uh, pro-suffrage senators elected. They were also campaigning in um, four states that had uh, referenda, uh, popular vote on whether women should vote, should be able to vote. Of course, only men could vote in these, pop in these referenda. So uh, it was a lot of convincing of men. And when the um, restrictions come in uh, for the, uh, the influenza pandemic and you know, masks and uh, I don't know if they use the word social distancing, but certainly crowds were known to be very dangerous. So all kinds of parades, suffrage parades had to be canceled, all kinds of uh, suffrage rallies, knocking on doors, which, you know, this is the same things that our uh, elect election cycle this summer and fall had to go through. Um, and they decided to keep their, their uh, supporters safe. And so they didn't do a lot of this. So they had to use the US post office, they had to use the mail to get um, uh, material to people. They had to um, tack signs up on trees. They had to use their imagination because they were being stymied by the, by the pandemic. So uh, the, the parallels are really uncanny about how they had to maneuver around the restrictions uh, during a pandemic. So I, I decided to write about it. And then there were uh, several suffragists who, who died um, or had family members, quite a few, of course, uh, who had family members who, who uh, perished because of the uh, uh, influenza. And one woman, um, and I'm trying to think if she was in Kansas, I believe, or Nebraska, and was a, a leader of the suffrage organization there. And she was um, uh, in bed with uh, the influenza and her doctor said, don't, don't you dare move. She was supposed to um, debate an anti-suffrage legislator about you know, whether that state should, should ratify the amendment. And she said, I have to do it. No one else can, can debate him. And so she dragged herself out of bed. She did the debate. She scored her points, made, made good, solid um, cause for, for why it should be ratified. She went home and she died um, of, of the flu. And the, when the legislature did meet a few days later, they ratified in her memory. So the suffragists had to deal with a pandemic. And the fact that it struck us in the centennial year, uh, causing so many celebrations and commemorations and marches and events. Uh, I certainly was about to go cross country on, uh, and attend lots of these. They've all had to be either um, postponed or canceled or you know, refashioned. Of course, I was supposed to be with you in Richfield in April. Um, so there is an irony in how we've had to deal with this in the centennial year. Well, thank you so much, Elaine. Uh, this is Leslie here again. Um, I think we don't have any more questions, but I'd just like to really thank you for your generosity um, coming to do this program um, via Zoom. And it was a fabulous talk. We've we've used your book in uh, I'd say the six or seven book discussions this year. So it's a fabulous book, and we're uh, so happy to have you here.
And I'd just like to thank you again and thank everyone for taking part today. That's, that's great. I just do want, want to thank you. Um, and also uh, just mention that the book is, uh, this summer was released in a um, young reader's edition which uh, is, is entitled Women's Hour, <clears throat> Our Fight to Win the Vote. And it, it's, it's uh, meant for your um, younger readers who I think will be inspired by this uh, tale of, of citizen activists uh, seeing injustice and um, learning how to, to make real and lasting change. So it's, it's become popular in libraries and in, in um, uh, reading groups, I get wonderful pictures of mother-daughter reading groups. Uh, so I, I recommend that, great great holiday gift. Uh, and um, it brings the story in a, in a simpler form to, to our young readers. And is it gonna be a television series as well? Or yes, it is. Um, it's in the works. Uh, it is not a documentary. It will be a scripted series. Uh, it'll tell the story probably, it, it'll be based upon the book. Um, there will be, I'm sure, some creative uh, <laughs> additions to it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. We're, we're working on it now. And, and Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton is um, executive producer and very much involved in it. So um, it's exciting. And um, I hope in you know, a year we'll, we'll be seeing it on our screens. Oh, well, that's fabulous. Thank you again, Elaine, and thank, thank you everyone for being with us. Thank this you. Afternoon. Take care. Thank you.